Okay. Well, we're going to, as I mentioned, our, the prayer. We're we're continuing our study on the church. We're going slowly through statement thirty-three. And uh, what I want us to be, where I want us to begin tonight is on the statement in thirty-three because it's a large, long one. Just begin with the phrase whom he has purchased and redeemed to himself as a peculiar, peculiar. Isn't it funny how some words sound when you just stop and try to peculiar inheritance. <laughs> and uh, this, of course, he's again, it's in reference to the church. So it's the church he's saying that Christ has purchased. It's the church that he has redeemed to himself as that unique inheritance. <laughs> it's an easier word. Acts verse 20. Let's turn to Acts first. Acts chapter 20, I should say. Acts chapter 20. Acts 20 and verse. 26. Now, depending on how far we get in this study tonight, uh, after we get through this Acts portion, we're going to be going through a lot of other verses very quickly. So um, and I just want to give you heads up on that, a little warning. But here in Acts 20, verse 26, the Apostle Paul, he was... On his way, he has been arrested, and he calls some of the uh, elders, some of the leaders, teachers and preachers from Ephesus to come, and they've met with him. And so he begins to instruct them, knowing that it would probably be the last time he would see them. And so he says in verse 26, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Now, I, I believe that this portion was and is, is one of the most important exhortations that you read in the book of Acts. Uh, while much of the book of Acts, it gives kind of a historical context for the, the church going out and spreading the gospel and seeing the, the church be built by Christ throughout that part of the world at that time. This portion here gives to the church definite clear instructions. And it's not only that what Paul was saying to them was for them. It's for us today. It's for the church today. And it doesn't matter where and doesn't matter what time. This is the, the instruction that gives safety and security and life to the local church body. Now, Paul indicates just how important what he is telling them is in verse 31. In verse 31, it reads, Therefore watch and remember that by the, by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. That shows how important and how needful this was for the church to understand and learn and to, <clears throat> to fulfill. So it is today. Um, there's different things that are, are mentioned in this portion that were not fully looking at uh, we'll just make mention of a couple things in a moment of why he had this uh, this prayer for them and this earnest uh, teaching this this warning of filled with tears um, part of it had to do first of all with the love and the care that Paul had for his brothers and sisters in Christ it's so evident in his uh, words that he states to these brothers that have come to see him uh, 
for three years he's prayed for them for three years he's wept for them and warned them and so as he's called these elders from the church of ephesus to come to him uh these men would have been probably quite young in the faith the church was uh just knew it in that part and so they were probably uh, themselves still at uh, well you never stop learning but they were still at a, a, a quite a learning age needing instruction and so he's given them they wouldn't have had a bible college seminary education they were probably strictly taught by paul <clears throat> when he was with them so he's now exhorting them telling them you need to carry on the work you need to be faithful in carrying out the work of the lord and uh and to do this note in verse 28 he says take heed therefore unto yourselves another way would be to say pay attention to yourself just like uh, say a person who is uh, is really concerned about the health of somebody else but maybe say they don't take care of their own health well he's talking to this church so these elders saying you're to take care of the spiritual health of the church but you also need to take care of your own spiritual health. You, you've got to watch yourself that make sure you know the truth, make sure you're growing in the truth and that the word of God is being applied in your life by the Holy Spirit. And so he's saying, make sure if you teach God's word, if you preach God's word, if you're telling other people that God's word says this and your life should be this way or that way, examine yourself first and make sure that you are not being as uh, some are hypocrites where they would where they tell you you to live one way but they live another so take heed therefore unto yourselves and this is of course necessary for the church body to be also healthy they need those who god has uh, given them that are not spiritually lazy aren't just kind of neglecting their own spiritual walk with the Lord. And it's this body, this church that Jesus purchased with his own blood. And we see that in that verse uh, 28. So that, that shows why it's important for the elders themselves to take heed to yourselves because you don't belong to yourself the church also doesn't belong to the elders the church belongs to christ and so this reminds us of how much the church is precious to the lord and so those who are called into ministry of of preaching and teaching the word of god they need to make sure that they take it seriously because of what the church is in the sight of God. Imagine he paid the supreme price for the church. And if God would go to that extent of doing that, we should want to make sure that the flock is taken care of, is provided for, and is given what they need to be a strong growing flock jesus spoke and told several parables of those who were set as servants to watch over the household of the owner of a house and the owner went away and while he was away the the head servant beat the other servants and jesus doesn't call us to beat one another nor does he call the, the elders to beat the others in the body of Christ. They're to take care. They're to support. They're to teach and feed the flock because Jesus shed his blood for the church. Now, in verse 29 again, just reading that over, it says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, 
not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Here's another reason why it is so important that first of all, those that God has, has given to, to minister in the church to take heed to themselves is because of the fact that there will be those who aren't the true teacher, aren't a true preacher of God's word, aren't true shepherds. They're, they're, they're wolves. They're in to destroy. They're in to cause havoc and divide and conquer. And they it says not sparing the flock. They have no regard for the flock. They might enter in and at first they might look as though they have a desire that people you know hear the word of god and live good righteous lives but they get in that way by looking like they care for the flock but they they have no desire for the flock no compassion for the flock and they will speak things that are are self glorifying as it says they'll draw away disciples after them that means that they they want to be the ones that are noticed they don't want people to see christ they want people to see them they don't want people to hear christ they want people to hear them and so paul again is saying the church was bought with the precious blood of christ so take heed to yourselves and beware and have your eyes and ears open to the word of god so that you're not taken by these uh, false ones these grievous wolves he says, for I know this. So Paul knew that this would happen. Uh, I know this. Jesus, he, he also warned about this in Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So they come in looking like the sheep, but definitely they're their bite is is not like a sheep they're 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 dangerous now the church body again is paid for and it's paid for with a payment that is so precious the precious blood of jesus the son of god it had to be the blood of jesus because the church meaning every one of us that are uh, have been gathered to him uh, that not one of us would have had enough ability or enough goodness or enough money enough righteousness or anything enough of anything to pay our way out of hell only Jesus and his precious blood was enough and uh, and by his coming into the world he came to call us out of the world as his inheritance he bought us and it's interesting by the fact that he bought us with his blood and then he also receives us as his inheritance. The church is the inheritance of Christ. Now, have you ever wondered about that? Have you ever thought about the fact that we are Christ's inheritance? Um, now, all of you, you're a beautiful people, but we know the, the church in general it's not always beautiful and you would think well how could how could that be an exciting inheritance you know what why would that be such a glorious great inheritance for jesus to have to have that a church but we we know that uh part of that is the fact that one day the church will be so beautiful so beautiful and pure when we write up an inheritance, we, you know, we write up, you know, all our stuff. We write up all our earthly possessions, material possessions, all the money we'll leave behind or houses or lands or whatever it might be. But in the case of the church, again, we, the church is the inheritance. So it's not a plot of land. It's not an earthly house that Jesus receives as an inheritance, the church is his inheritance. 
And if you go to Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, And in verse 2, note it says, it's talking about the Lord Jesus. He says, has in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. So the church is his inheritance, but also all things are his inheritance. Uh, all things meaning all that is of, of God, all that is of, it'll be in, even the new heaven and new earth, that's his inheritance. Um, all that is in heaven is his inheritance. He's been appointed heir of all things. And so the church is part of that inheritance. Now, being that inheritance as the church, being the church, it means that, again, we belong to him. Because that's what inheritance is. It's something that's transferred from one to another. And when you receive that inheritance, it belongs to you. And so the church belongs to Christ. And First um, Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20 says, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God? You're not your own. You are bought with a price, and the price was the blood of Christ. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. And so using both terms of the church is bought with the blood of Christ and the inheritance that the church is the inheritance just shows how we are not our own. The church belongs to, is the property of the Lord Jesus. And so, again, that's why it was so important for Paul to tell the elders of that church in Ephesus, you, you watch it. You watch how you handle my church. You watch how you, you feed the church and protect the church. Because the church belongs to Christ and it is his precious inheritance And um, a part of the idea of the inheritance, though, there's something that always makes me amazed, is that we who are inherited by Jesus are made joint heirs with him. This is uh, most amazing, that, that we would become joint heirs with him. I'll just read a couple of verses on that. We won't turn there, but Galatians 4, verse 7, it says... Wherefore, you are no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And so the church is not a slave. Each member of the body of Christ is not a slave. We're now the children of God. We're heirs with Christ, heirs of God through Christ. Galatians 3.29 says, And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You know, heirs according to the promise, all that you see what was promised to Abraham is found in Christ now, and, and we're heirs of that. Uh, that's why when it talks about, um, Jesus says that the meek shall inherit the earth, uh, we are going to have that inheritance in the new heaven and new earth. It's ours in Christ. Isn't that wonderful? I can't explain what that's going to be like but it's going to be more beautiful than I could ever imagine, more wonderful than I could ever imagine. So Romans 8, 16, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And so we are purchased with the blood of Christ. We are now the inheritance of, of Christ and we are joint heirs with Christ. Now again, the fullness of this, to understand it, it, it's 
basically right now impossible for us to fully uh, because to try to understand the the infinite things of Christ uh, with our finite minds we, we can't truly grasp it but um, now I just want to say a couple things about this inheritance before we move on with a couple other thoughts a couple points so turn to first peter chapter one first peter chapter one And in beginning at verse 1, we read that this is from Peter, of course. 1 Peter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And here's the verse I want us to just get a couple things out of. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, I love the, the way in which Peter is led by the Holy Spirit to write this and the way he writes it, where he starts off talking to, writing to the strangers scattered throughout these areas. He's, he's using terms that we would use for people that are, say, without a home without uh, a place of of dwelling within a country they're not even living in their own country they're they're far from their own country they're scattered abroad and then he brings it in to show them yes you're scattered now but something's coming there's something waiting for you that that as the the people of god the chosen the elect of god who have been uh, saved through the blood of Christ, cleansed and sanctified by Christ through his blood, you have an inheritance with Christ. And note in this portion how that Christ is unchanging, and so our inheritance in Christ is imperishable. It, 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 it's something in which goes in opposition to the type of inheritance we have in this world where it whatever we have is perishable it's not going to last forever but christ is unchanging so our inheritance in christ is imperishable christ is holy therefore our inheritance in christ is unspoiled um, it, when we're when we are with christ when when uh, we receive that inheritance, it's never going to become corrupted. It's not going to decay. It is unspoiled. Christ is eternal, so our inheritance in Christ is unfading. And then Christ is our mediator, so our inheritance in Christ is reserved. And he stands and he holds it for us. And these things that I've just mentioned are found in those verses. Verse 4, to inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. This is what we can truly find comfort in and and joy in while we are the church manifesting Christ in this world. And it's a reminder that 
the church is not an earthly organization. It is a heavenly one. It is a one that's ruled not in an earthly manner. It's ruled by Christ. And we enjoy and are blessed to be his people. Now back in Acts 20, now here, here's where we're going to go through a lot of verses. So get your Bibles ready, get your fingers and thumbs ready. We're going to go through a bunch quite quickly. Because back in Acts 20, Paul not only instructs them to watch themselves, and in that to remember who they are and what they are in Christ and the inheritance that we are, that we are the inheritance of Christ. But he notes in that Acts 20 passage we've read that they are pictured as a flock. Now, of course, we know a flock is a flock of sheep. And it says in our statement 33 that the church is a company of visible saints. And the Apostle Paul is picturing them as a visible flock of God. And so a flock is made up of more than one sheep, right? A flock is a bunch of sheep. The church is not one individual. The church is many, many individuals. Uh, the Bible's description of the church is both Catholic, that is universal, but it is pictured as local throughout the New Testament. And so we're going to look at several verses, go quickly through them, and then just say a couple things about them. First of all, Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16 and verse 18. And I say also unto you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Here Jesus speaks of the church in its fullness. I will build my church. It's a one church statement here. He's not talking in terms of, I'll build one church here and one church there. This is the church that he is building, which uh, we know is built also of the saints of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And one day that church will be all together in fullness and glory and be exalted with Christ in heaven. What a day that'll be. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it shows the power of this Christ building his church. As he's building this church, when it talks about the gates of hell not prevailing, that means that's what's falling down. That's what's being, being uh, overthrown are the gates of hell. As the gospel is preached and as the church of Christ is built by Christ himself. Now, next one is Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5 and verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands and everything. Here Jesus again is, or the, the term church here is again in general of the whole body, the whole church, that Christ loved the church. Now when did he start loving the church? Did he start loving the church when, just when the church will be in heaven, when it will be perfect and pure? 
or did he start loving the church even before the church existed? Even before time? Yes, he's always loved the church. There's never been a time, and th these things, again, are the so infinite in understanding. We can't understand eternity and the love of Christ for, for his church has been eternal. But it, that shows how amazing his love is. Christ loved his church, and he gave himself for her, for the, his church. Verse, uh, with verse... Did I read verse 23 yet? Yes. Yeah. Okay, verse 25. And husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Again, here Jesus loves the whole church. He's he's going to he's sanctifying the whole church. He's washing, and cleansing the whole church, and that whole church will be a glorious church. What a wonderful, loving Savior this is! Powerful. Um, next one is Colossians, Colossians chapter one. Colossians 1 and verse 24 says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. So the church is presented here as the body of Christ. It's quite a picture there, isn't it? As it says there, uh, Christ, or that which is behind the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. So the church is the body of Christ, spiritual body. And that means, again, it's, it's in reference to one body, one body. Ephesians 5.27, I guess we could have stayed there, but if you quickly go back to Ephesians 5 and verse 27, it says that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Uh, he's again referring to it, picturing it as a body. As a pure body, a, a sinless body, a, a, a righteous body, a beautiful body. And so Jesus will present that whole body, that whole church in the end. It will be when he presents us to the Father. He'll present the whole church. He's not just going to present to the Father the roof of the church. He's presenting the whole church on that day. Praise the Lord. But the Bible also does reveal it and uses the word church in terms of a local sense. You go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 1. What it says there in verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So note how he refers to it in plural in terms of where they are, seven churches which are in Asia. And then he goes through the seven churches. He names them the church in Ephesus, the church in Thyatira, Laodicea, so on, Smyrna. The use of the word church is plural is also 
found in First um, Corinthians sixteen. First Corinthians sixteen. And verse 1, it says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so you do, you do, do ye. So he's given orders to the churches. He's given direction to the churches, plural. So here's here again is uh, the, the local use of it. Um, in fact, in fact, it even goes to where there's reference even such as in Romans 16, verse 5, where it says, Likewise, greet the church that is in your house. So not only the church in Galatia, but he refers to a church body that's meeting in a particular house. Um, just go back to 1 Peter. Just one more here. See by the... Our time is moving on here. I just will have this as the last one. First Peter chapter five. He says in First Peter five verse thirteen, the church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, salute you. So does Marcus, my son. Note how he says that. He refers to the that local church, the church that is in Babylon, but he does show how that they are united together as being elect by God together. So there's reference to the local application of the church, Babylon, but also that general in terms of all the church is the elect of God, elected together with you. And um, I, I see as our time's gone on, I, I have a lot here that I wanted to get through, but I'm not going to. So rather than try to push through, uh, I'll end it there. But just to say that most often when you see the church used in its general form, it's, it's talking in terms of, and it'll describe not always, but almost all times, it talks about that fullness and that glory that what we will be in Christ when it talks about the local it gives the application of our being sanctified and our use in the world in which we live and so there is a that local application of what the church body is to be in their local uh, arena and uh, and so it's very interesting when we'll see this as we carry on that as we have been called out of the world into Christ, as the body of Christ, we're then, as the church, sent out into the world. And uh, we'll, we'll see more of that, Lord willing, next time. But uh, just to, to conclude with that and just remind us the fact that we are bought by Christ and we are an inheritance of Christ. So we're owned by Christ. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this word that teaches us of our reason for existence of why we are part of the body. That Christ is building a church that is his, belongs to him because of the sacrifice he made on the cross and shedding his blood. He did so because of his great love for us. And that, that as he rose in victory, now goes forth throughout the world by his spirit and by the word through the church, proclaiming the gospel of, of his grace and mercy and souls are being added to that church. He's building a church that Satan can't withstand, that, that the enemy is defeated and the gates of hell not prevailing at all even though we we're living at a time where where you're in your sovereignty allowing the enemy to raise its ugly head against the church 
and cause tribulations and trials. We thank you that we have this most, most sure word of truth that proclaims that Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. So we thank you that we belong to Christ. We thank you that we are an inheritance of Christ and that through him that we are also joint heirs with him. May that be an encouragement to us, Lord, as we wait upon Christ, may we be sanctified and be made cleansed and prepared for that day in which we'll be presented to you by your son. We thank you in the precious name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.